Hey everyone, and welcome to The Kodakery. I'm Megan. And I'm Josh. This week, Josh and I are talking with Janet Borgerson and Jonathan Schroeder. These avid vinyl collectors eventually realized that they were seeing themes within the albums they had, specifically with their cover designs. This led them down the path to writing their book, Designed for Hi-Fi Living, the vinyl LP in mid-century America. We were lucky enough to be welcomed into their home to discuss their project amongst their collection. It was really fascinating learning about the American culture through these covers. You definitely do not want to miss this episode. So, let's jump into the Kodakery and talk with them. Hey everybody, welcome to the Kodakery. Megan and I are on the road today. We are actually sitting in a room with beautiful posters and mountains of records. And we are going to talk with the authors of Design for Hi-Fi Living, the vinyl LP in mid-century America, Janet Borgerson and Jonathan Schroeder. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. Thank you. So let's start a little bit um, right right with the book. What came first, the idea for the book or the record collection? <laughs> Definitely the record collection. We've been collecting... You know, really, when we thought about it, we've really been collecting records, you know, since since our teenage years. Uh, we got together when we were in our 30s and kind of joined our records and I think began collecting in earnest. We lived in Providence, Rhode Island. They had some great record used record stores and they had, you know, good goodwills and Salvation Armies that we began to seek out records that were kind of neglected. <laughs> well, I mean, we have our our high school record collections. We have our elementary school record collections, and they are things like Walt Disney, and then we get to Joy Division and New Order. But there was something about these cast-off, strange-covered albums that that both of us found. Uh, Jonathan was in California at the time. I was in Ma- Madison, Wisconsin, and there was a St. Vincent de Paul right around the corner, and that meant not such good things for my my studying, but it was amazing for finding strange record album covers. Okay, so you guys put your record collections together and realized maybe we have something here? Or, I mean, at what point did you, did you decide, let's... I mean, because there's so many things that you can deduce from all of these records, totally. you know? And yeah, yeah. so then you ended up writing this book. Maybe you could give our listeners like a just an overview of the general idea of the book. Well, I think one thing that helped us begin to think about records and the categories of records that we ended up writing about in the book is that we lived in an apartment in Providence, Rhode Island, that had a picture rail. And so we would come back from the store with all these interesting covers of the records, and we'd put them up on the picture rail. And we'd begin to see themes, and we'd begin to see commonalities. And we knew that we loved the blue of the ocean and the, the green of the palm trees and the bright colors of the the cloth that people were wearing around their waist. We knew they were Hawaii records. We knew there was something about Hawaii records. But when we put them up on that picture rail and we started to see the commonalities, we actually started writing about our records in terms of, of Hawaii. And is that where the idea for the book started, was with the Hawaii collection? We... we did a lot of projects about Hawaii. People were really interested in that. We lived in Europe for a while, and we would do our presentation on Hawaii records or marketing of Hawaii through records, and people liked it. And we kind of because we played music. <laughs> yeah, we played music. <laughs> you know, they were colorful. The most of the presentation. We wrote a couple pieces for a magazine called Cool and Strange Music that was fun. You know, it was a, it was fun to write those pieces. And we just began to get more serious a couple years ago. Again, our colleagues really liked what we were doing. We got good feedback. And so we decided we should do a book. I think one of our colleagues especially was so amazed on uh, about these Music for Backyard Barbecue albums because she had been spending her time here in the U.S. She came from Eastern Europe and just thought, wow, I, I need all these new cookbooks. I need all of these etiquette books, really. How do I have people over at my house? And she thought she was the only one who needed help. And when we did our presentation, it was at a consumer culture conference, she said, oh, my God, now I realize even Americans need to learn how to barbecue. How do I put my silverware out? Where do I put my napkins? And I think she, her enthusiasm almost like that cliche about art that you find an object 
that's so familiar and you make it unfamiliar. And it was as if these record album covers were helping people see things in an unfamiliar way. And when she saw that barbecue album like that, she just thought, oh, I'm not alone. Other people needed to learn as well. And so has that, like, just, I just want to make sure we tell the audience a little bit, like, what the book is about. So (laughs) you're talking about record album covers, not necessarily the content of the record, correct? Yeah, we, we always start with the record album covers. And we, in some sense, we tell a story or a history of the U.S. post-World War II through record album design, separated into two big sections, home and away. So the home records talk about how to have a dinner party, how to have dinner at home, how to have how to decorate your house, how to have a buffet. And one of the, the interesting chapters in that section is about modern art and design. So how abstract art, modernist furniture ended up on record albums and what does it all mean? And then the away section, we decided, wow, people were getting away from their suburban, new suburban post-World War II homes because they were going on honeymoon. So we used a chapter, because we had a lot of honeymoon records, oddly, we thought, um, as this transition between home and being away, because that might have been the first event that catapulted some of these people out of their home comfort zones into the bigger, wider world, even going internationally. And so Away has uh, concerns about airlines, food from faraway places, but also um, Capitol Records had a Capital of the World series, which focused on international music. And then Adventures in Sounds from Columbia is also quite famous. They have some wacky records like Sorcery by Sabu. Um, <laughs> and then we figured the farthest away from home you could go And because we had the record albums already, uh, was space. So many of our albums have space as a theme, even if it's just the cover or maybe they've got theremin. So everyone's thinking spacey, haunting sounds. Um, We really let the records dictate all of that. We picked them out of, of our collection. We put them into themes because the themes came right from those records. Like, oh, my God, we've got to have a chapter on Cuba. Oh, my God, we've got to have a chapter on how to have a dinner party. And who was making these albums? It seemed like there were maybe, at least in the home section, there was like the Gracious Living. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's it's these companies that just said, you know what, I think there's a, a place for this at this time and they just started doing it you know it yeah the the music for gracious living was a was a series put out by columbia records and one of the things we learned is that the photographs on the cover were taken by a modernist architectural photography firm from chicago hendrick blessing and hendrick blessing they were shooting all the famous chicago skyscrapers frank lloyd wright so they were very much bringing modernism to the world we found out that Columbia hired them to do these covers for this record series, and they're kind of earnest attempts to help Americans, you know, with their new suburban houses, have people over. Because a lot of the work that we'd done was in consumer culture and also in terms of marketing, we approached many of what of the things that we saw in these covers from that perspective. Also in the liner notes, helpful hints on how to decorate, helpful hints on how to paint, helpful hints on what sort of food you would need to buy at the local grocery store if you were going to have a Chinese dinner at home. So we really see it because of our backgrounds probably um, is an attempt to get people thinking about the products and consumer goods that are available, in some cases newly available, post-World War II. And the records really are um, graphically, illustratively, through the liner notes, and even the music, making points about how Americans could become modern through the consumption of of goods and, and objects. And uh, like one of the series you just you just alluded to was the uh, the dinner series, and like I was fascinated to look through and see like how do you have a German dinner at home? <laughs> and it, there's there's music, there's recipes. It's like an entire complete vinyl kit for totally. entertaining. Totally. And, and like at the time, I mean, it, the world was 
I don't want to say it was smaller, but it was different, right? There's no internet. There's no, like, were people traveling as much? Like, what made this something that was a, a product that people wanted to go out and get? Well, we were interested, too, that, you know, this this music for a German dinner at home came out 10 years after World War II. So we also see some of these records about German dinners and also travel to Germany, German drinking songs, travel to Japan as kind of a post-World War II rapprochement with our former enemies. So it's, it's interesting when you take that cultural lens to see, wow, what was going on that Americans were being reintroduced to Germany through food, through music, through beer? Yeah, yeah I mean, the whole thing is, is really fascinating to me to imagine that there is a curator of American culture uh-huh. putting out these records, uh-huh. you know? I mean, so I haven't heard them. Are they, um, so there was one that I was looking at. Uh, okay, hear how to plan the perfect dinner party. <laughs> so is somebody um, narrating this? Are they saying to you like, hello everyone? Yeah. And, and then interspersed there's music and, you know, is that how they, uh, most of these are? The Hear How to, to Plan a Perfect Dinner Party, it's part of a series from Carlton Records called Hear How. So it's Hear How to Become a Better Bowler, Hear How to Improve Your Golf Game, <laughs> but also interesting titles like Hear How to Tell Your Children About the Facts of Life, you know, Hear How to Achieve Sexual Harmony in Marriage. It's a really interesting... Like the birds and the bees? Exactly. <laughs> oh. And their spoken word, the Hear How to Plan a Dinner Party, It's it was a radio couple, radio personalities, and they narrate how to do it. Example. Yeah, Janet's about to play... Uh, from the record that so I was here's just an example about, yeah. from here how to plan the perfect dinner party let's have some fun let's invite our friends to a polynesian winding a beautiful dinner with a tropical accent a hula li as they say in hawaii and we all wear lays about our necks and sit on the floor on mats and eat poi with our fingers and roast pig not so fast my dear lays about our necks yes but we don't go native that's fine in hawaii but we live on the mainland. Let's settle for a dinner we can manage ourselves, but give it a haunting Polynesian appeal. Can I wear a grass skirt? Must you? Well, not if you object, (laughs) but we'll make the table look as lush and beautiful as those seductive girls in the islands. A long table with a deep green cloth or a Samoan tapa covered with ferns and green leaves. So Josh is laughing, and it is comical. I mean, do you have a sense of what the reaction was at the time? I mean, I, they're they're droll, they're entertaining, but again, they're very earnest. I right. mean, they give you the menus to to do for dinner parties. And we think of it as you know, we're thinking there wasn't the internet at this time. Um, there were etiquette books, there were radio shows, there were classes you could sign up for and go to. And But we think of these as sort of similar to a podcast. You know, lots of people go online to learn how to make a particular recipe. And for us, we think, oh, yeah, the, these were the dominant information distribution format of the time or one of those dominant information distribution formats. And so in a sense, they're just like a podcast. It's easy to forget how popular records were, how important they were. Like now it's it's something that has become almost like a niche mm-hmm. community that loves vinyl and supports vinyl. But then there was only vinyl, so that was how everything came out. And you could come to the end of uh, your shopping trip at the supermarket, and there as you're going through the line would be the record, Hear How to Have a Chinese Dinner at Home. So they're making those uh, bits of information available to you in the context in which you would be able to pick up some of those consumer goods. Right. Just like a home and gardens magazine is, you know, yeah, it's just what people were, how they were consuming information at the time. Mm-hmm. Vinyl and music traveled internationally. So how, I mean, I don't know if this is something you guys know, but like how were these things received by Germans or by, like, like how, how did these represent American culture to the rest of the world? Well, it's interesting for the Capital of the World project the, or chapter, we looked at an archive at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, that a Capital Records executive gave his papers, and he was the guy behind Capital of the World. And so we looked at the company memos, and we could see that these Capital of the World records, so these were you know, German drinking songs, but also An Evening in Beirut, uh, Cairo, The Music of Egypt, and they were sent around the world. 
They were clearly designed for international audiences, but also uh, U.S. servicemen overseas. This this was a big part of it, and immigrants. So the Italian, you know, music, honeymoon in Rome was a very popular record among Italian Americans here in the U.S. So it was really interesting to see. We could see, find out how many copies of German drinking songs were selling in Argentina. That's amazing. Yeah. That, that's amazing. Um, and, and what? Do, what? Do, as looking at it academically, like you have, and really analyzing these covers and everything, what? What did you guys take from it? Like looking back at that era. I mean, in a way, it almost seems like a superficial representation of things, but it probably there's probably more depth to it than might appear. So, like, how? how what did you learn from American culture at this time by looking at these record covers and analyzing them the way you did? I think it made me appreciate the size of the United States, the far flungness of the population, and the sense that it's a mistake to believe that at some point everybody did the same thing and that somehow now in this era we've gotten away from it. In a sense, what it helped me understand was that it was an invention <laughs> to begin with. And it wasn't necessarily that it was reflecting these cultures or reflecting um, these desires. It was, in fact, co-creating them, you might say. So I think the most profound sense I got was what a unified effort was going into trying to create something like the United States, because there is nothing that unifies us unless we can come together around certain rituals, certain beliefs, certain cultural practices. And, you know, today it's, it's, it's fragmented and, and in some sense is quite frightening, um, the, the disparateness of, of our practices together. Well, and one of the themes that we ended up developing is because we were looking at the post-World War II era, we began to see the Cold War and the ideological battle that was being waged between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, we began to see that reflected in the LP designs. And when, especially we had a chapter on Cuba, so, oh yeah, Cuba, that's the Cold War close to home. And I think one of the reasons we are attracted to Cuban records is because when we grew up, we couldn't get Cuban things, you know, Cuba was off limits. So whenever we found a Cuban record, we were really interested. Wow, Cuba, you know, honeymoon in Havana, dinner in Havana, afternoon in Havana. That really was a different era. I'm standing here looking at dinner in Havana right now. Um, and on the back, we have a recipe for ground meat Creole style. And uh, it has the, the name of the recipe in Spanish as well. And it gives you the basic, I would say, instructions. And yeah, we'll play a song from that if that's okay. Yeah, that'd be great. That's great. I would love to have a soundtrack to like making dinners. <laughs> I think I need to get that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, these these dinner albums were really kind of a multimedia package. Yeah. You've got the music, you've got some photos to show you, you've got some recipes, and uh, you know, you play, you follow the recipes, and then you put on the album to play for your guests. Have, have you guys made the recipes? <gasps> This is the next really fun project that we're totally excited about. I was just texting with a friend today. She's willing to come on board and help us create some of these, see if any of them are viable. And of course, what we would love to do is create some kind of an event where people could go to the different zones of the different albums and we could recreate the covers for French dinner, or Chinese dinner, or German dinner, or Italian dinner at home, and then make the meal that um, the people thought we would make if we were listening to those records that's awesome um, that just sounds so fun. <laughs> um I'm, i was looking at a lot of these home records and to see what is 
um, similar to them, and they have these. Almost all of them have pictures of people mm-hmm. on on the covers, um, and I guess that's they're just going right for it, you know. <laughs> like it's not it's not like an artistic approach. It's like this is what you would could look like mm-hmm. doing it, you know. Mm-hmm. And I guess that just speaks to more of the instructional nature yeah, of these records. Yeah. yeah, they're very straightforward. And one of the things we enjoyed finding out about is the photographers and the artists behind the covers. So we we reproduced one cover by the photographer Lee Friedlander and another by Roy de Carava. But we also kind of discovered or rediscovered album cover photographers like Wendy Hilty and David Hecht that it was fascinating to find out about their histories and begin to recognize their styles. So we'll, we'll be looking through now a bin of records. When we first were putting the book together, this was not our focus. We really had not even thought carefully about who was taking these photographs. We recognized patterns. We recognized ones we loved. And probably not surprisingly, we would have a number of the same photographers' work. But then as we started to write about each cover, We'd be like, wait, who took that picture? Oh my God, that's Wendy Hilty. That's just like this one. Look at that space. Look at the, you know, the the sense of the still life that that's coming through there. Or this guy Paul Garrison, who did a Hawaiian one and another one of a woman on the beach, and they they're, they've got this just certain quality. And now when we go through the bins of records, we're instead of just looking for categories or themes, we're like, who took that picture? And, and it's made our lives more complicated I'm now. Because sure. <laughs> it's one more thing to keep track of. More and more, yeah, more and more categories. Because now it doesn't matter the theme, it's just who took the picture. So yeah. Uh, yeah, it's like when I came in here, I was wondering how you guys organized your albums and now i'm thinking do you have it by uh album cover photographer i mean that could get i could get intense (laughs) well and i think that's one thing we're always reordering our collection and you know we obviously had to do that in a very serious way for the book Mm. but we're planning a, a second book based on dance records so we have about 400 dance records maybe more now um and we're just planning out this book which it'll be designed for dancing, how mid-century LPs taught America to dance. And here the idea is, well, yeah, we can separate it by the dances, so foxtrot, tango, mambo, twist, but we're also separating it by themes, so like the drum. We have a lot of records with just a drum on the cover. Yeah, the idea that... um well, we don't want to give it all away, but just that sense that, that themes are coming through and we don't want to do it just in terms of a time sequence. We don't want to do it just in terms of, oh, all the Mambo records are going to be together. It's kind of fun to think what patterns are we seeing uh, that allow us to divide these records up and talk about things like dreaming and fantasy because we have a number of records that are called dream dancing. Do you guys collect records from now as well? I mean, do you buy records yes. from artists today? I know it's yeah. different because it's we're talking about two completely separate types well, of... Yeah. That's one thing we realized when in writing the book, that during the 90s, really there weren't new vinyl being released. It was only used vinyl. And then vinyl has come back. And now we find that, yeah, we're buying new vinyl. Like, you know, there's Bjork's newest record there. Um and we're not buying CDs much at all. We just have stopped buying CDs. And so it, it's interesting that we've gone back to buying new vinyl just because now it's available. We felt like for a long time, every single record we touched was a used record. Mm-hmm. And so we were often being taken down paths to uncharted vinyl <laughs> music, but also cover territory because We didn't know what we were looking for. It's just what happened to be available. But, of course, we do have our favorite bands and artists, and we try to, um, Jonathan kind of every year goes to Piccadilly Record Manchester and gets their list so that we can buy some of their newest uh, things that they think are the most interesting. And we've got a super, uh, just a favorite band called Horse Beach that they're from Manchester, and we heard about them through Piccadilly. And whenever their vinyl comes out, we buy it and we went to their concert they were there and we bought the vinyl from them which was very cool um but yeah i think it's gonna turn out that we're just all about vinyl in any era any, any way you can <laughs> get it i'm afraid to say <laughs> um, yeah. there must be uh, other rooms this is the first time i've seen this room that we're, i mean 
the breadth of your collection. <laughs> or there's, there's other records, I'm assuming. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's funny because we bought a, a USB turntable to make MP3 files of the records in the book as we're doing radio shows. And I realized, oh, well, now we have that turntable. I could buy another little system for the living room. <laughs> so all of a sudden, speakers and receiver showed up on our on our doorstep. It went from being, the turntable we'll take with us when we're doing presentations to, now we have another stereo. <laughs> <laughs> and we've kind of dedicated that stereo to jazz. So, you know, that's kind of our jazz 50s stereo. Okay. How, how many records are in your collection? We think we have about 5,000. Yeah. Nice. Okay. What are albums covers of today saying? You know, they seem to me to be um, not always uh, obviously related to the general theme of the album. They're just like out there or whatever. But you know, is there a is there something unifying in what's being put out today? I mean, there there was a big shift in the seventies toward kind of personality so the the photographs of the band or the performer and that seems to be carried over today so a, a huge majority of the albums that are being released now have a picture of the performer and that wasn't necessarily true in the era that we wrote the book about a lot of times they had art or design or they hired a professional photographer to capture this kind of social tableau for the album. So that's one of the, the differences we see. But one could say that the same kind of um, cultural pedagogy is coming through in the sense that in the United States, in the, in the book, we are often contrasting U.S. with Soviet um, ideologies, and in the sense that the individualist ideology tends to rule the U.S., as well as certain kinds of um, modes of altering one's individual personality, whether it be hair or clothing or makeup or the freedom to expose oneself um, to different art, different environments, whatever, you still might say, it's less obvious, it's less culturally based, it's less community based, it's just become way more individualistic, but we're still selling the US individuality. Yeah, that's true. Absolutely. I was gonna ask you what you thought of the Beatles White Album. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the Beatles it White says Album. says something with their nothingness. It's kind of ironic because I think they wanted to have this blank album that didn't mean anything. And now, of course, it's one of the most highly collectible albums. Mm -hmm. And if you can get a w copy of the White Album without any wear, or, you know, tear on the, on the cover, you've got a valuable artifact. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that when we were looking through the book, I noticed were Kodak records. Uh -huh. And this may not be news to everybody at Kodak, but it was news to me mm -hmm. that we made records. So I'm looking at one right now called the Kodak Hula Show. Mm -hmm. And there's another one that's Super 8 Sound Effects, I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about these records. What, yeah, what was the, the purpose of these? The Sound 8 was a record that Kodak released. It says Volume 1, but we've never found Volume 2. So I'm afraid it might have been one of a kind. <laughs> But it's beautiful, you know, Kodak red and yellow on the cover. And it's a record of sound effects designed for you to mash up with your home movies. So, you know, again, most of the home movies were silent at that time. And so it provided sound effects that you could create your own sound effect for your movies. And for a while, we were working on what we called the packaging of paradise because we were, we were in possession of so many of these Hawaii albums like 500 or more now and we saw patterns in those be the, the the racial representations the gender representations um and also just the sense of how do you sell uh, a conceptual resource a geographical conceptual resource hawaii and we talked about it in terms of packaging in the relationships to marketing of, of places and uh once we started thinking of it as packaging, that every single record album cover became um, a package. And when we started to find these Kodak records, that was fantastic because here was a company that was using its major <laughs> selling point, film and cameras, at an event that they themselves created, the Kodak Kula Show. And apparently you would come to the Kodak Kula Show. Before you entered the gate, there would be film 
film stands. You could buy your film if you thought you were going to need a flash or something, whatever you might need. They were selling it there, and then you went in. And then Kodak sponsored the dancers, the announcers, the sets. And so you could take your pictures of the Kodak Kula Show with your Kodak camera and Kodak film. They probably even had a place that they would, you know, develop it for you. <laughs> that is like the, the ultimate Kodak vacation right Should there. Song? Yeah, yeah. Okay, we got a song from the Kodak Kula Show. Okay. Yeah, the Kodak colors we felt like. I wonder if they recorded this there, like live, or if they played the record um, at the Hula Show. That's an awesome question. As far as I know... It didn't sound the, live. As far as I know, this was recorded in a studio, but the, the show did have live, live musicians. Live music as well, okay. And, you know, so this is what tourists expected, of course, when they went to Hawaii. You know, well, we want to see the Hula. And so it's so interesting that Kodak just kind of made that happen for yeah. the tourists you know yeah and so it, it it took a place outside and just beautiful colors so we've found people there's lots of postcards about the kodak hula show that we found but also we've found actual photographs that people have developed of their own of the kodak hula show and then gaf Viewmaster kodak hula show it's quite a little phenomenon we love the idea, too, that they could use the Kodak Kula show as an opportunity to give people tips on how to take photographs. Yeah, I was just seeing that. So the there would be that sense of be sure to capture part of a leaf and the, the palm tree in the foreground of your photo and capture that blue background of the ocean and the dancer. And, and I mean, it's easy to get a little bit flip about it in a sense. It's, it's not authentic in some way. But on the other hand, people are going maybe it's the first time they've ever been off the mainland, they're taking a trip. Um, they don't have the time to catch every sight, and it was it was probably an earnest attempt by Kodak to make this possible for people to see. Yeah, I mean, you can't think about it with today's yeah. lens. You know, it it was completely different, and uh, people weren't exposed the way we are now to the entire world at every given moment. Right. And it's, so, yeah. it's one of the things that's always amazed me. The more uh, working at Kodak for the last couple of years is how much they spent to educate the audience. Like they invented an artistic medium, but then also showed people almost at every step how to use it better and better, probably to keep them engaged and to keep them excited about film. But there's all kinds of examples of this where they put out you know, printed books. They had people in national parks helping people take pictures. It's really incredible. Um, um, I was talking to Josh about it, and I thought, like, oh, I wonder how this would be received today if we, mm -hmm. if somebody, but then, but then I thought about it and um, I don't know if you guys use Spotify, mm -hmm. but there's like the backyard mix, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. no, they're not um, telling you how to have the party, but they're setting the tone. Oh yeah. If no, you need it, you know? <laughs> yeah. I've seen dinner party mixes, certainly, right, right. you know, or chill mixes for after midnight. We have a lot of um, records for, you know, music to study by mm. or music, you know, to read by, and of course, lots of music for late at night for seduction, things like that. Right, right. <laughs> music for seduction. I like. There's one of the album covers in here, and um, I'm trying. Maybe I'll paraphrase until I find it. And it's about. Um, hold on, I gotta find it. Mm -hmm. It made me laugh because. Hold on, you'll laugh with me. This one, it says cock cocktails in conversation, but I put conversation in quotes yeah, in my yeah. head because there's, these two people, yeah. they don't look like they're talking. There's not much talking going on there. <laughs> and she looks like she's had a few drinks already, <laughs> and he's, he's got that martini glass uh -huh. as close to her lips as he could without actually forcing the martini down her. So, yeah, seduction plans, not probably much conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so so let's talk a little bit about why, why do you both think vinyl has had the resurgence that it's had well it's it's so interesting because we we're big fans of record store day and i remember being in record store day a couple years ago and you know we saw young kids you know so 
10, 11 young teenagers, and they were just buying $1 records. And they didn't know at all what the music was about. They just liked the cover. So this one kid, I remember he, he brought, he showed his parents an Olivia Newton-John record. He said, oh, look at this cover. It's great. You know, and, and the, the parents were kind of smirking because, you know, they probably didn't like Olivia Newton-John. But the kid was just fascinated by the cover and the cover art and the design and how it brings back another era, in this case, the early 70s. And not, not to make universal what came from our own experience, but I do wonder if if our attraction to the narratives that were being told, both visually from the covers, but also through the liner notes. I mean, we've learned a lot of interesting tidbits from these liner notes, things about American history. And then you look it up and you're like, whoa, there's so much we don't carry forward when we're giving a historical story. And these record albums have given us hints and some of them we followed up on and then they're just more than you can really even even follow up on and I think there's the narrative aspect and since there's the big phenomena now about storytelling and marketing storytelling everywhere the notion that storytelling is something so natural to humans and 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 so maybe there's something about that narrative quality of the covers and the liner notes together and then putting the music that there's a story and we're attracted to stories and maybe vinyl with that larger f- format picture and, and the ability to communicate through liner notes and the music, they're telling a story and maybe we're just attracted to them as stories. Yeah, I was going to say the fact that it's large mm. and it's tangible and you're holding it in your hand. Yeah, you can have a CD, but it's like, mm. you know, um, it's a lot smaller. So it just it just makes it more of an experience. Mm. Really Well, and I think we know people who are buying new records and you get the download codes, so they don't really ever need to play their record. They just like the art, maybe there's some inserts, and especially a lot of the new releases are coming with extra material in the record to get you to buy it. But you can you get the music and you just play it on your, your iPhone. Though I have to say that parting with, how much was it, like $39 or something for new vinyl, new vinyl. gives me pause. I mean... What I think it was a magnetic fields collection, and I bought it, but I could not believe I was spending forty dollars yeah. on a vinyl record. Yeah. So we're used to getting them for a dollar twenty-five. Or <laughs> right, right. When there there still is an enormous amount of of used vinyl, yeah. then there you know the new stuff. And like I'm I'm relatively new to vinyl. Like we grew up with it. My parents had it. And one of the things that I think, at least for me, has been really special is like the I'm not just like listening to a record that like, I'm not listening to a song that I listened to when I was a kid. I'm listening to the record mm-hmm. that my parents the played very, for me when I was a kid, and I'm playing that for my kids, and to see them react to it, and there's something really special mm-hmm. about that. And I guess it takes me to a quote from uh, David Sachs, who we interviewed for the podcast before, where he said, digital is the height of convenience, mm-hmm. and vinyl is the height of experience. Mm-hmm. And there really is something to it. Like, it's a different, mm-hmm. finite experience. You're going to sit down and enjoy an album again, not just a playlist, but an actual album start to finish. Yeah, I mean, my older sister visited me a couple years ago, and I pulled out her copy that now I have, because she's just not so into vinyl, her copy of The More of the Monkeys, and she had drawn mustaches and things Mm -hmm. on the monkeys, and I played it for her, you know, and it, it, it really was kind of, it kind of made my hair stand up on the back of my neck, because it was like, not just the record or the music, it was her record with her annotations on the cover. And I can blame Jonathan for bad behavior in high school because we did know each other in high school, like going out dancing when I wasn't really old enough to get into the bars and he would help arrange that. But uh, (laughs) some of the records that I have in my collection from the B-52s to the Clash, they were records that he probably played for me first or I played for him and we ultimately danced to at some party. So we have like the very Clash record or the very B-52s records that we danced to. It's not just a copy of it. It's the one so right. yeah we actually we each have one album from this book you do mm-hmm. yeah and they're both christmas we're oh. both christmas yeah. nerds yes. um mine is the one with the rock hats on the front oh yeah the colorama and you yeah have i have the rca christmas in new york volume two yeah. and yeah. uh yes yeah, one of my favorite christmas records i got it from my in-laws they they had it and we're like we don't have record play anymore here's a pile of records that is that's the one that has kind of the fuchsia tones the mother and child who are shopping in the that one was a riot because we got um a linkedin message from a guy 
who said, hi, my dad took the photograph on that cover. And do you know of other albums that he's taken the photographs for? He's sort of trying to collect it. The photographer's David Addy. And I did some research online so I could have it in my head, a vision of the kinds of things uh, that, that his father had taken photographs of. And I have not found anything signed yet. It has a little typeface, David Addy, on the pink, on the uh, Volume 2 Christmas album. But I'm looking for that style now. And so a couple people have contacted us. Do you know if my parents made any other album covers? And, we're, and again, it's making our lives more complicated because we're looking now. <laughs> well, and now I know that Volume 1 exists. It so does. I must track it down. Oh, do we have it? If we had it, we'd give it to you. I don't know if we have another copy. <laughs> Well, and it turns out that David Addy did, you know, he was a fairly interesting photographer and he had access to Truman Capote and did, he recently published a book of Truman Capote photographs. And so, yeah, he, I think his son is very interested in kind of reviving his, his reputation and we're right there too, trying to find his record covers. That's awesome. Do you have a favorite album? Is that a, is that a, too yeah, cliche yeah, of a we question. Should, we should ask these questions before we wrap up. What's your favorite album in your collection? Both of you. You got you to gotta pick one out of the five. I mean, that's not really oh, fair. Oh, Lord almighty. Okay, how about this? What's a great one from your collection? That's fair. I, I think one that we would agree is uh, move, uh, Movement by New Order. So this is the Joy Division's lead singer, Ian Curtis, hung himself the remaining members of the band tried to figure out what to do. They had songs that he had written, and they recorded Movement. It's not a well-known record. It's not really one of their most popular records, but I'd say it's one that we play maybe the most. And a funny little story that goes along with it is that the person who designed the Joy Division and New Order covers, Peter Saville, um, we asked him if he would blurb our book, and he did. And he said some very nice things about the collection that's in Design for Hi-Fi Living. And then he came to a talk that we gave in London, and we presented him to sign a copy of, of Movement. And uh, so now it's even more meaningful. But in terms of the book itself, um, the some of the, the records that are in the Capital of the World series are so amazing because they're from a part of the world that... Uh, it's so rare to hear music from. And what's the one from the Belgian Congo called? Yeah, it's like Kasango, music from the Belgian Congo. And it's orange, and, and, and the people who are dancing, it's actually a shot from the mines, King Solomon's mine, so it's actually a, a movie shot. It's not an authentic shot. Um, but it's very primitivizing. Um, there's lots of problems with it, obviously. And the liner notes lean a little bit into the damage, horrific damage that the Colonialist Project did in the Belgian Congo. Um, but it's a phenomenal record on many, many points. And then there are more fun ones, like we love Let's Listen, which has the Bertoya bird chair, it has the, the babe sitting in it, leaning back with her arms akimbo, I guess you would say. And uh, in behind her is the, the little stereo system and the record is playing. And she's just kicked back in her modernist furniture listening to music. <laughs> Um, something you said just sparked a question that I wanted to ask. Um, do you have a sense if a lot of a lot of these albums migrated into CD, or or they just can you only get them in record form? Not so many have been re-released on CD. So we're we're giving a talk in Oxford uh, next week, and they're going to be selling some vinyl. And we found I think about ten of the records in the book. I mean, there's a couple of Brubeck, Dave Brubeck records. Those certainly have been released on vinyl. I mean, on CD. But most of the records are still fairly obscure. Yeah. There was that moment, uh, maybe in the 90s, when they were doing more Space Age Bachelor Pad releases on, on CD. But in terms of finding the Capital of the World records on CV, CD, no way. They're, yeah. they're on vinyl or, or, or not. Although, if you go to Discogs and some of those places, some people have put them online. Yeah, I found the um, How to Have a Barbecue on YouTube. Oh, I thought that's great. <laughs> I gotta be honest, I wouldn't go to that barbecue. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't play classical music at my barbecue. And, and one of our barbecue albums, uh, I think it's the Music for Gracious Living series, the cover suggests that you're having coffee they have the coffee pot and the coffee mugs. And I'm thinking, 
where's the cooler? Where's the keg? <laughs> not a lot of beer, mostly coffee. So yeah, not my favorite barbecue either, probably. <laughs> What, what you've been able to accomplish with this book, the analysis of these covers of these records, a lot of that is because those things actually exist for you to find and uncover. Mm-hmm. When you look forward from today, the media that's being created right now, mm-hmm. um, 50 years, 100 years, what, it, what is it that you, in, if, if you guys travel in a spaceship, you're in the future, mm-hmm. um, you're going to analyze the media that's being done today, where are you going to go? What are you going to look at? And what are you going to draw from what's being created right now? I think it's going to be vinyl records. <laughs> I think it's all the rest of it's going to be untouchable. I don't know. I mean, we've we spent time at the at the Eastman Museum and have been trustees there. And one of the things we hear at the meetings in terms of the storage is just keeping the technology from the past up to date enough so that you can continue to access those things that have been stored in that now somewhat you know, primitive form, even though it's a digital form. So I don't know. Do you have an idea? That's hard. Well, I mean, I think one of the things that strikes me is that how well preserved some of our records are, you know, they're 60, 70 years old and they sound fine if they've been taken care of. And I think this, this kind of helps us rethink obsolescence because I think when the CD came, the CD manufacturers kind of convinced a lot of us that, LPs, vinyl, is obsolete. And yet, vinyl is the one that's going to survive CDs. So I think it's it's interesting to understand how well-preserved this medium can be. Yeah. Obviously, there's links to film there, you know, on the preservation, and that's where our, our wheels are turning. But yeah, absolutely, vinyl. And, and the idea that you can go get something for 50 cents from from another you know time period and just just as easily put it right on your record player and go you know um where i don't know an old format of some nature that i have on an old hard drive or something like that you know i can't listen to it anymore yeah it's it's it, it's no longer accessible and i mean i suppose if i were a futuristic lover of 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 future fantasy you know maybe everything would just be available directly to my brain from some new form of wireless system but but what what scares me about all of that is that the reliance I have to have on other people to provide for me um, whatever it is I want to have access to and if I want to provide myself if I want to have access to things that I want at a certain time that I can say that I own uh, and then I can pull off a shelf and 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 do something with at this very moment I don't have to depend on anyone else for that now electricity yes i am relying on someone else to provide me the electricity and and there are you know these other things that complicate that that model as well but um yeah i like having my records so as you you've completed the book it's out in the world people are reading it people are coming back to you what what would be the one thing you would want the audience to take away from design for hi-fi living i think what we tried to, to do in the book is change the way you think people think about album cover design. We tried to deepen their appreciation of the thought and the care and the strategy that went into the photographs and the artwork of of these mid-century albums, but also the broader cultural themes that the albums reflect. So just like film or comics or literature of the era, album covers are a rich cultural resource. Thank you so much for the wonderful book that you guys have written. Everybody out there, tell our audience where they can get the, get a copy if they want it. Uh, in Rochester, Barnes & Noble is selling it. You can certainly get it on Amazon. Uh, it's published by MIT Press. MIT Press has a nice website. You can buy it direct from the nonprofit publisher. We, we wish what we could say is, oh, there are so many great bookstores here in Rochester, and they're all carrying it. But given the fact that so many bookstores no longer exist, um, you know, in city by city basis, we could say, well, this one small bookstore or this. But it, it I hate to say it, but online is how people are typically picking it up. But Barnes & Noble in Rochester is apparently selling it. So, so check your local bookstores, Barnes & Noble's, The Strand, wherever you may be, and uh, go to Amazon.com to get a copy. And sometimes they order it for you, you know, and they, they benefit, the bookstore benefits from ordering it. So there's no harm if one is willing to wait to order it directly from a bookstore. And what about um, Hi-Fi Dancing? When is, what, what's the timeline on that? 
we we're giving ourselves a year, but we're waiting to hear uh, if our press is interested in another book like this. Okay. Yeah, so it's it's in it's in process, and uh, we're we'll be giving talks and taking dance lessons uh, <laughs> to get get ready for our dance book. That's awesome! Great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. It is a great satisfaction to be able to speak to you through the medium of this wonderful invention.